Good morning, Discovery. Uh, little Stevie Ray Vaughan for Stevie Ray Robinson. And Mark, that's what I call wake up music. We're all wide eyes, bush still here now. Thanks a lot. And so are we down here. Yes, Steve, uh, as you're going into observation 1-4, we'd like for you to disconnect the J2 connector on the power interface box, and we'll see if that helps. Okay, and uh, do you see a decent image uh, of the comet on your screen right now, or is it just too messy to see? No, we've got a very good image. Discovery Houston, uh, we have the parameters for an upcoming maneuver at 15 colon 30. When you're ready to copy. Discovery Houston, uh, just to let you know that the ground is about to initiate a fuel cell purge, and with that, uh, the planning shift uh, is uh, heading off, and uh, Wayne Hale is here, and uh, Billy Mack will be talking to you, and for us, it uh, was rather exciting to have the opportunity to talk to you uh, at the beginning of your, your wake-up, and we'll do it some more. Okay, Mark. Uh we copy that. We appreciate all y'all's work through the night to replan our days. I know we have some busy days, and y'all go through a lot of efforts with the FAO and all the different payloads to uh, try to get it all organized, and we sure do appreciate that. Too bad we don't get to talk to you a, a little bit more before you sign off, but I know you're ready to go home. Thank you. I want to talk to Bjarni. Hello, Mr. Prime Minister. How do you read us? We read you uh, loud and clear. I see you pretty well. You know, you said you seem to having fun. You look pretty good from up, from here. How we look uh, from where you are? Well, with this inclination, we've gone to have many, many passes over Canada so far, and we'll we'll have many more. And I've had a, a fabulous look at. Uh, most parts of Canada now, good shots of Vancouver and Calgary and Edmonton. Beautiful uh, view of Montreal this morning and uh, Maritimes a couple of days ago. So we've had a, a great time uh, looking at Canada from up here. Good. I'm very happy for you. You have been a very patient man. You're a bit like me. You had to wait 14 years before you managed to go there. I had to wait 30 years to have the job I have right now. That's why you're leading us, and I'm just a follower. I'm only halfway behind you there. <laughs> so uh, you're uh, doing some pretty important experiment uh, there for for us. Can you describe some of it for for uh, other Canadians who are watching? Sure. In fact, the uh, main experiment that uh, I'm involved in up here is testing what we call the microgravity vibration isolation mount. And this is a system that isolates experiments, fluid physics, material science experiments, protein crystal growth experiments, of the type that we're going to do on the space station starting uh, sometime after next year, and isolate them from the vibrations that are uh, in the space craft itself. We spend a fair bit of effort getting experiments into the nice environment here in space to add to the kind of things you can do in labs on the ground, and now this last little bit actually just cleans the environment up for the experiments, uh, just that last little tweak to get it right down to the micro-G acceleration level. And I understand that you had some uh, experiment with some uh, students from Saskatchewan the other day. So was it all right? 
Yes, there was 20 students that talked to me a day or two ago, and uh, they had a, a good set of questions all ready to go, and I enjoyed that very much. Good. Then are you using Canada Arm? You know, the, our arm that uh, we see uh, being used in this trip, so do you use the one that uh, on this trip? Yeah, in fact, we used the Canada Arm on the very first day of the flight, uh, you know, a few hours after we were in orbit here to launch the Christus Foss satellite, which is uh, co-orbiting with us about 40 miles behind us right now. And it's actually doing a lot of measurements of the upper atmosphere to better understand the dynamics of the upper atmosphere and the ozone problem uh, in the upper atmosphere. Uh, we will use it again towards the end of the flight to retrieve that. And in between, we've used it on a couple of other experiments to assist those. Now, hey, it's a great privilege for me to be able to be up here uh, representing Canada. Um, and I've uh, enjoyed the work uh, with the space agency for a number of years getting up here, and I think it's a great privilege to, uh, and I'm very honored to be up here representing Canada. And we do get a chance to talk to Mark O now and again, Mark Arnaud now and again. Uh, he's actually uh, the Capcom on the planning shift, and so we typically get to say, speak a little bit to him in the evening and uh, sometimes early in the morning when we get up. And we get up basically around 2 or 3 in the morning, your time. <laughs> so I uh, wish you a very safe uh, return, and uh, you say hello to your uh, fellow uh, astronauts who are Americans, and uh, you know we're very pleased to see a Canadian with them, and we can work with the Americans very well uh, most of the time, and I can say that I know that the mic is open at this moment. Well, for sure, in fact, the experiments that I'm doing here on the isolation mount and the fluid physics experiments we're doing on it are really all being done in collaboration with our NASA colleagues and the work that I've been involved in on the Mir Space Station has also been with the support of NASA. So it's, uh, it's very good to work in relationship with NASA, and uh, I'm sure it'll continue for the years to come as we get into the space station era. So, have a safe journey, my friend. Bonjour. Thank you. Au revoir. Astronaut Steve Robinson used the special telescope uh, to zoom in on hale -Bopp. Steve, tell us about that, first about that telescope, and what are we learning about Comet Hale-Bopp that was so exciting to all of us when we saw it from Earth that uh, we, we couldn't learn from down here? Well, John, we think it's pretty exciting, too. Uh, we have a small telescope that we that is mounted not outside uh, our crew cabin here back in the payload bay, but right, right in here, right in this area, about uh, 10 feet to my right, there's a window looking out the side hatch. This is the hatch that we climbed in the shuttle with. And this is a telescope with uh, about a seven inch uh, diameter mirror, uh, or lens that is. And it attaches to the side hatch and looks out the window. The telescope's about two and a half feet long and just about the diameter of the window. And we point the whole shuttle. We don't point just the telescope. We point the whole shuttle at the comet. And then it has a very uh, highly intensified uh, uh, CCD camera that's the, that's a digital camera on the back of it, and it's uh, enabled to look at the comet in the ultraviolet spectrum, and that is something we cannot do from Earth because the atmosphere protects uh, us, us Earthlings and everything on the Earth from the ultraviolet rays of the sun, but it also keeps us from learning about the ultraviolet spectrum of astronomical bodies like the comet Hale-Bopp. We've got we've asked our viewers to join in with questions, and we've got a great one from a 12-year-old. Aaron Hendry sent us an email asking if Hale Bop looks the same from up there as it did from here on Earth. Alex, yeah, that's an excellent question, and it's a question I had until about uh, a few days ago when I was able to see Hale Bop through the uh, telescope here. Now, one thing is, back in March or so, Hale Bop was nearer to the Earth and to the Sun. And so we were able to see it more brightly, and it had a longer tail. Uh, now it's about twice as far away from the sun as it was then, so it's not as bright. The tail's not as big, but still, it's it's relatively close to us, and uh, we can see it much more clearly from space because the atmosphere doesn't uh, diffuse the light. And uh, also, you don't have to get up real early in the morning like you do. You're going around the Earth so many so so fast that you can uh, stay in bed to a reasonable time of day. I know you'll appreciate this, Eric and uh, then you can get up and still see the comet.
Thanks, Steve. One of the main purposes of this flight is to test the new Japanese robot arm. I call it the, the mini arm. It goes out at the end of, uh, I guess, the other robot arm. It would be attached to the International Space Station someday to repair and replace pieces of the new International Space Station without uh, making astronauts like you go outside to do it. Uh, what do you think of the robot arm and its operation so far? Any surprises? Well, John, we've had a really educational uh, experience in flying this arm for the first time. You're right, this is the, uh, the prototype for this small, fine arm, as it's called. It will go on the end of a long arm that will go on the uh, Japanese experiment module when the International Space Station is put together up to that point. So this is in a few years from now. And this is the flight test of the small, fine arm. So it's quite dexterous. In other words, it could do a lot of things with its, with its uh, joints. It's fairly small. It's only about uh, a meter and a half to two meters long, depending on how you stretch it out. But it has uh, six degrees of freedom in the joints. In other words, you can move it around just about like your arm. It's almost hard to talk about the arm without taking your arm out and moving it around, because that's just about what you do with the hand controllers. And uh, Dan and I have had a great time, first of all, training for the flight. We've gone to uh, the Tokyo area twice to train on the Japanese hardware. We have lots of Japanese software and hardware here in Houston or down in Houston that we've trained on for many months. And finally, it's been a really great experience to come up and test the space hardware that's going to be uh, built in, in final form for the International Space Station in a couple of years. And let me just say that we've learned a lot about the arm. Yes, a couple of surprises, but it, in general, it's really worked great. A fine piece of engineering. This viewer wants to know what kind of philosophical thoughts come to mind when you're in space, maybe thoughts that wouldn't come to mind when you're down here on Earth. That's an easy one, John. Lots of them do. When you look out the window, the first time you look out there, to me, the first thing that really occurred to me was how small each of us humans really are. The heavens are very large. They're huge. And the Earth is huge. And uh, when we're on the ground, we tend to think... Uh, you know, we're busy and we're responsible and we have lots to do and we tend to think that we're the center of importance and, and you sort of have to. But let me tell you, when you get ready for a space flight and you realize that, first of all, thousands of people are helping you get ready for the flight and, and uh, assuring your safety and doing the engineering and all the checks and you're the beneficiary of that, then you get up above the Earth. You look down on, on the beautiful Earth and you see evidence of... Uh, of uh, mankind down on the earth, both good and bad, and you look out in the heavens, you see the comet, you see the moon, you see the stars uh, rising and setting over the earth's limb, you realize that you really are very small and very, very lucky.